All right, let's get started. So we're talking about the projective space uh, and projective geometry. And I want to start talking today about projective transformations, OK? So we've already covered the very basics of projective geometry. Now let's dig deep into uh, the tools that projective geometry gives us to solve the problems that we solved in 5460, but in such much neater and easier ways, okay? And not only are we going to be able to recover the structure of objects in better ways because we use perspective projection cameras rather than affine camera models, right? But also the algorithms that you end up with are just much uh, neater. They're just clear algorithms that don't need, sometimes don't even need some point correspondences and when those point corresponds are needed, uh, we can make use of them more efficiently. Okay, so let's see that. Okay, so projective transformation. Um, a projectivity uh, we're going to say a projectivity is an invertible mapping H from P2 to P2, okay? So a projectivity is an invertible mapping from P2, remember P2, the projective space of two dimensions, right? That, as we saw last time, it can be represented in R3, right? The real domain of three dimensions. Um, from P2 to itself. So you can write that this uh, mapping, let's call it H, is a mapping from P2 to P2, right? Um, and this is a projectivity, I should say. Let me uh, put this in commas. Um, if and only if this um, H of any point X in my space is given by capital HX, well, remember, H is our projection matrix. Remember from 5460, 5460, excuse me, that we talk about this projection matrix H. That's a three by three matrix. And what are the constraints? With H, a non singular three by three matrix. So, any non-singular but otherwise arbitrary three by three matrix defines that projective projection, right? So let's see an example of this. Straightforward example. Um, a planar projective transformation, and remember that we're talking about planar projections still, right? We'll move into three, P3 soon, but P2 defines planar projections, obviously, in two dimensions. So a planar projection transformation is going to be given by x1, x2, x3 primes here times a matrix H, which has entries H1, 1, H1, 2, H1, 3, 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, 3, 1, 3, 2, 3, 3, and then x1, x2, x3, right? And here, as always, we have our point x, right? This point x that we were talking about here, right? This matrix H and our point x prime, right? Which correspond to this, right? Our H prime, which is our transformed point. Now, an important thing that we discussed last time about this example, an important fact, is that points 
map into points, right? In P2, and lines map into lines, right? So everything's beautiful, beautifully preserved here. So we can use them interchangeably, of course. Um, and in fact, this is one of the few unchangeable properties that you will see of the projective space. Lines always project into lines. It doesn't matter how many projective transformations I apply to a line. A line will still be a line after any projective transformation. And that, my friends, is one of the few things that are invariant to the projective transformation. So what, means that, what this means is that if I have a straight line, it doesn't matter how many transformations I apply to it, it will still be a straight line. So the concept of a straightness is invariant to any projective transformation. You see that? OK. Hence, um, I can use that, uh, this fact, to do the following, to find transformations from, say, an image one into some image two. Now, let's say that I do have image one. Image one is given to me, but I do not have image two. And image one, say, has this two lines right here, let's say L and L prime if you want, right? So these are, or L1, L2, these are my two lines. And um, I can also define points here, say these four points, right? In that image. Now, thanks to that transformation, I can use two facts. I can use facts that I may know about these four points or about these two lines. For example, let's say that I know that these two lines are parallel, right? So I can use that to find a transformation that transforms these two lines into parallel lines here. All right? Or let's say that I know that these four points are not only defined on parallel lines, but the distances between these two points are known or are equal. I can also use these facts to find that transformation H. You see? So even though I don't have image 2, I can always find a transformation H that gives me that image given some constraints on the distribution of these lines and points in the second image, right? So for example, as we had seen not so formally in image processing, I could define my h prime as h1 prime over h3 prime and y prime as h2 prime over h3 prime. And what, oops, excuse me, I have too many primes here, right? Um, let's say x and y instead, right? Um, and here what I'm doing is I'm defining my value x as x1 over x3, right? This is perspective projection. And my y coordinate as x2 over x3, again, projective pro uh, perspective projection, right? Or projective projection, right? And if I substitute this here, right? If I use this and get x, y, and then the third component, then this is equal to h11 x plus h12 y plus h13 divided by, and I'm actually not using the right things, I'm going to use h1 and h2 rather, right, h2, x2, and then here 3, 1, x1 plus 3, 2, x2 plus h1, 3, and then here I'm going to have h2, 1, x1, h2, 2, x2, h2, 3, and the other line is the same, 3, 1, x1, plus 3, 2, x2, plus h1, 3, right? I'm sorry, uh, that's going to be not 1, 3, but 3, 3. 
right? Yeah? And that's a, one result that we actually saw in, in image processing, introduction to image processing computer vision, if you remember, which is actually comes from the projective transformation, right? Okay. This transformation here is uh, usually called a rectification. And the reason it's called a rectification is because uh, it rectifies the image, right? So if I take an image of a plane from a skewed direction, I can rectify it to its frontal view, right? To its an skewed version. Okay, so that's not that different from what, well, it is exactly the same that we saw in 5460, but just showing you where it comes from using the projective space, okay, the projective geometry. Now, what I wanna, the reason I wanted to revisit this from 5460 is not only to show you where it comes from, but to tell you now that this can be applied to anything else, not only points, as we did in 5460, but to lines, to conics, or anything else that we want to, right? So let's apply this to lines and conics. So uh, for lines, if we want to apply this to lines, you know that we have L prime is going to be equal to HL, which is exactly the same equation that I have here, right? Same equation, nothing changes, where H stays the same. It's this matrix, right? So far so good? Now, um, you can also uh, compute L prime transpose as this is gonna be L transpose H inverse, right? I can switch uh, places by transposing the two, okay? Same thing. And for conics that we introduced, remember we introduced conics in our last lecture, right? So for conics, I'm gonna have exact same thing. I'm gonna have now X uh, transpose CX, right? Because now this is a conic, it's no longer a line. So I need to multiply it on both sides of the matrix, right? which um, is going to be equal to H prime transpose. Let me redo that. H prime transpose times, now here I need to project that conic onto that space, right? Or that, or I need to apply this transformation. And to do that, I need to apply, um, I need to apply H inverse transpose, right? Conic H inverse times H prime. And this H inverse transpose, I'm just gonna write it as I always do, as the inverse of the, and the transpose, right? The inverse transpose. So a conic, also transforms into a conic, right? So I can write that my new conic C prime is H, trans H inverse transpose conic H inverse, right? So same thing as before. The only difference, obviously, is that for lines and points, I only need to multiply on one side because it's a vector. The other one, I need to multiply on both sides, right? Okay, that's it. That's how you can apply to um, lines and conics. Now let's revisit the different transformations that we know about. Remember from 5460, we know at least three types of transformations, right? The isometry or the Euclidean transformation, the similarity, that's the Euclidean transformation times the scalar, right? The affine transformation, 
it would be the third, right? Okay, so let's revisit them. In this new um, in this new framework, okay. So let's do uh, isometries first. These are transformations of the plane R two, or so-called also Euclidean transformations, right? And they are of the form x prime equals a rotation and a translation, right? So my edge here is nothing else in an isometry, is nothing else than applying a translation and a rotation, right? Simple enough. Okay. Um, we can also write this down as say x prime, y prime one is equal to, let's see, the cosine of the angle minus the sine of the angle, the sine, the cosine, the, tr uh, T x T y that define the translation zero zero one right and these are known as the Euler angles if you remember from fifty four sixty right and we need to multiply this by some alpha where here alpha is uh, either positive one or negative one and it just defines a mirror image remember that as well from fifty four sixty we derived the result for camera calibration. Our result was up to a mirror image, right? Okay. So that this defines the orientation um, of the isometry. And therefore, uh, isometries have three degrees of freedom, right? Um, because it's up to this um, orientation. Okay, so that is that. Now let's look at the similarity transformation. Or let's revisit rather the similarity transformation. So, whoops. The similarity. is an isometry composed with an isotropic scaling, meaning that they have x prime is h times s, or excuse me, h times x. And I'm gonna call this, maybe we can call this hi, capital I for isometry. We can call this hs for similarity. And this one is given by R T zero one X. And now here that rotation is multiplied by some scalar S. Okay. So if you prefer, you can write this as we did before, X prime, Y prime one is equal to the cosine of the angle, right? Same as uh, as the one we have right there, sine of the angle. These are, again, the Euler angles. The sine, the cosine. But now I'm going to multiply these by the scalar S. Okay. And then zeros, Tx, Ty, the translation, and a one, and x, y1. Okay? Yeah? Makes sense? And therefore now we have the three unknowns that we have, or degrees of freedom, right, that we had before, plus the scalar, so we have four degrees of freedom, right, in this one. And then the next one is going to be the affine transformation. Okay, and the affine transformation is 
And those are non-singular linear transformations that follow the form, if you remember, from 5460, which I hope you do, or otherwise, please review this. <laughs> this is very important. Uh, it's a matrix A here, right? A, a translation vector here is zero, vector of zeros, and a one. Or if you prefer, you can also write this as A11, A12, A21, A22, Tx, Ty, 0, 0, 1, right? Same thing. And then we can write this as x, y, 1. And I'm sorry, let's write this as x prime here. And let's put here x prime, y prime, uh, 1, right? Just to follow, same notation. So how many degrees of freedom do I have in an affine transformation? Six, good. So it's six degrees of freedom, right? So isometries, if I apply a isometric transformation, these are invariant to most of the measurements that you can think about. So length, for example, is not gonna change if I have an object that has a specific length and I apply an isometry transformation, I maintain that length, right? Angle between two different objects is also maintained. The area within an object is also maintained and so on, right? Now, in um, similarity transformations, uh, it's invariant to the ratios, right? Of these different uh, measurements. Okay, good. Uh, what else? So let's see one more important thing about all this. Now, this is gonna be a slightly more challenging topic within what we're discussing, but let's see if we can Uh, go over this smoothly. All right, so, um, so we have, um, okay, let me define, uh, let me use this in an application, so do an example. Okay. And what we're going to do here, we're going to define our matrix A over there that we have for the affine transformation. A is going to be, okay, so let's assume, let's, let's go back for a second. Um, let's assume that we have recovered our a affine transformation or affine shape, for example. For example, we have used affine structure from motion so we described in 5460, and we've recovered the affine shape, right? And now we want to recover the rotation so we can go from an affine shape to a similarity shape, okay? So um, we note that A can be written as R theta, which is the rotation matrix defined by the angle theta, in planar geometry, right? Using the Euler angles that we have to find there. So cosine minus a sine, sine, cosine, right? And then a matrix D, that matrix D is the matrix that specifies the shear of the affine space, right? Now remember, that in Euclidean geometry, this will be a one and a one because the vectors, the, the basis vectors of the Euclidean geometry space are of length one. That's what this specifies. And obviously they are orthogonal to one another, right? But in affine geometry, that's not, that's not true, right? The length of these vectors, basis vectors are different. Are any arbitrary length different than zero? 
And therefore, you have that the shear, right, that the length about one dimension is not the same as the length about the other dimension, right? So this specified by that matrix here. And that has to be rotated by some rotation here on both sides, where I rotate on both sides of this because our transformation is, is not invariant or is uh, up to an arbitrary rotation, right? Everything that we can recover. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put this, right? So this is what we have, but I'm going to uh, divide this, or I'm going to solve this, rather, solve this uh, by uh, using SVD on my matrix A. And my matrix A, it's equal to UDV transpose, right? Whatever SVD is. And I can rewrite this as UV transpose times VDV transpose. And I can assign this to my rotation and, whoops, theta, rather, right? And the other one to that transformation, right? So with a simple SVD of my matrix A, right, I can now recover the rotation of my similarity transformation, right? Isn't that cool? Up to an arbitrary rotation, which is this one, right? This arbitrary rotation, obviously. But remember that we don't care about the arbitrary rotation because if I recover the object like this, right, or recover the object rotated like this, it's still the same object, right? So that's what the arbitrary rotation means, that I'm trying to recover the structure of this object in 2D now because in implantum geometry. And instead of getting this, I'm going to get this or that. And it's an arbitrary rotation. It's irrelevant. OK. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to use this result to recover the transformation between two images, right? So I have a scene uh, in 3D space, for example, right? I have a scene here in 3D space, and I can take, and well, my scene obviously has to be 2D, so this, say this plane 2D here, and then I can take a picture with a camera that it, whose image plane is parallel to my two-dimensional scene, right, or two-dimensional object, and that's going to give me an image, right? Or I can take a picture from the side, right? And then if I do this, I get this skewed image that we we're describing before, right? There's this skewness. And I can now use this definition here, right, to find this solution not as an affine transformation, or rather the affine transformation, right, the, tr the affine transformation A that transforms one to the other, right? And that allows me to work with rotated camera angles as we have seen before, right? Just a few minutes ago. Okay? So, and then from here, I can recover uh, the re from the actual image to the, uh, to the rectification. Now, if you want to practice this at home, what you can do is um, take any picture that you already have, uh, or actually a picture on a magazine is best, right? Take a picture that's printed on a magazine, and then put it on a table, and then take your camera and rotate it at an angle, right? So you get some skewness, and take a picture of that picture. And that's an affine transformation, right? And then apply these methods to recover the original image, right? 
by using point correspondences as we did here or by using the parallel lines. Okay? And we'll talk more about parallel lines in a second. Okay? All right. Remember, I suggest that for these algorithms, you practice, 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 because you can know the theory, but if you don't practice these things at home, you're never going to get there where, you know, when you go for an interview, uh, the employer is going to know that you know what you're talking about, right? That you actually know how to implement these things. Okay, so a projective transformation now is given, remember, by any non-singular linear transformation of homogeneous coordinates. So these three different, uh, one of them I have already erased, but these three different transformations that we have seen before, we saw them in 5460, right? Um, now let's talk about the projective transformation. So let's see. So a projective transformation and that's where we are heading to where, right? I mean, this is our interest here today is given by a non-singular Uh, linear transformation in homogeneous coordinates, of course, of the form x prime is equal to, let's call it hp now for projective, x, where hp is, let's see, at, that's exactly the same as the affine transformation, right? I have a matrix A, right, that defines my <coughs> typical affine transformation. My translation vector t, same as the Euclidean transformation. And now here, I'm going to have instead of zeros, because this cannot be singular, this has to be any vector, any random vector, v. And then here, a scalar, small v or v with different font or mu or whatever, whatever you want to use, OK? And this one has, of course, eight degrees of freedom now. And now because we are, remember, this is a three by three matrix because we are in P2, right? In the projection space of two dimensions. And therefore, this V vector is V1, V2, right? It has two entries. Right? It's two dimensional, it's two vector. So what that means is that in projective space, in 2D, we're going to need at least four point correspondences to complete or to compute the projective matrix, right? Now remember that a ratio of length or a ratio of angles is an invariant in a fine transform under fine transformations. That's not true for projective transformations, but a ratio of ratios of length and a ratio of ratios of angles are invariants in projective uh, space. Okay. Okay. Um, so again, let's put this together, looking back at what we saw in 5460 and what we have seen here now, we can write our transformation more uh, compactly as follows. Any transformation H, any projective uh, matrix uh, defined by a projective camera, right? Which is what we're interested in. So let's say a projective uh, camera model uh, is going to be given by h is equal to hp, ha, or hs. Or if you want to compute the inverses, uh, you can interchange them. You can write hs, ha, hp. Doesn't matter uh, if you do it one way or the other. 
um, again, uh, they relate to one another by its inverse, right? Whichever you call H and whichever you call H inverse, okay? And this is equal to, let's see, HP, we're gonna use an identity image, well, okay, let me not, I already told you, but let's not do that. It's V transpose, and I'm gonna assume one here for simplicity. Then here I have K, zero, zero transpose one. And then here I have S, R, T, zero transpose and one. Okay. Now K is an upper triangular uh, matrix. So this is an upper matrix. And the determinant of K has to be equal to one, so it's normalized. And what we do with this is that we can define a, the part of the affine transformation that we have, the shear, right? The rotation, the translation, the scalar. And now here, what we are missing to make this a projective transformation, nothing, right? This is gonna be then the identity matrix. And what's new for projective is just this one, right? So this comes from the affine transformation, this from the similarity transformation, right? And this is what I need for the projective transformation. And then here, zeros, a zero again. So for example, right? We can see uh, that, uh, let's say that my H, my capital H, it's uh, this one. I compute capital H and I recover these numbers. Zero, five, eight, six, one, 2.707, 8.242, two, one, two, and one, right? Let's say that I compute my H, my camera matrix, and I come up with these numbers, right? And I can decompose this into these different components of these three different matrices. And what am I gonna get? I'm gonna use actually this other notation. Let's start uh, for, with the similarity. Uh, with the similarity, I'm gonna get two times the cosine of 45 degrees, negative two times the sine of 45 degrees, two times the sine of 45, and two times the cosine of 45 degrees, zero, zero, one, two, one. And so this is HS. Note that I'm using H inverse to estimate here, okay, in my notation. Okay. And you can do H or H inverse, it doesn't matter, right? You can call whichever you want, but just make sure that you're consistent because the results are different, right? If you do it one way or the other. Um, then HA is going to be 0 0.510, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. And the last one is going to be one, zero, zero, one, right? The identity matrix, remember? And then uh, here I have zero, zero, one, and here I'm missing a one and a two, and that's it, right? So I can decompose this transformation into its similarity transformation, it's part of the shear transformation, and then it's part of the projective transformation. Right? You see that? Now, um, it's sort of important to um, understand the geometry of the projective space. Now, we'll talk more about this 
like at the very end of the course, close to the end of the course. Um, but let me give you an example that you can practice, you can do this at home. This is a, you need scissors, be careful not to cut yourself. <laughs> a piece of paper and a stapler, that's all you need. Um, but let's um, see what the projective space can look like, right? Because projective spaces are really weird and we just need to visualize these things sometimes. So take a piece of paper and cut a corner of this or a line. So you get a strip like this. Okay. Now turn it over, but instead of like this, you turn this one over and you do this. And now you take a stapler and you staple it. Ouch! Just kidding. And be careful. <laughs> okay. And anyone knows how this is called? Mobius, what else? Strip? Very good. Right? And this is really cool. This is a projective, this, the projective space. It's a way of visualizing a projective space. And what's cool about this is that you can now start at any point, right? And you go around this and you follow, right, this line on that surface. And you go like this, right? And like this, and like this, and like this, right? And you end up the same place, right? and you've visited both sides of the piece of paper. It's weird, right? <laughs> Escher, the famous artist, made that famous, right? He played with these kind of things all the time. Um, that's what allowed Escher's uh, drawings, uh, some of them, right, were so interesting. It allowed to do him these weird drawings because he used the projective space. And those are the weird things about the projective space, right? That, um, yeah, you just have a one-dimensional object, <laughs> right? Because you're always on the same surface. So this object only has one surface, right? It doesn't have two sides, it's just one side to this, right? There is, because if you follow the path, it's just one side. <laughs> you're always on the same surface. Um, so um, yeah, that's a projective a space. Do one at home and um, see other types of projective space that you can actually visualize in the real world like this, because it's really cool. Okay. All right, any questions? So let's go back to our application that we had before, and let's see what else we can do with this. Okay, so let's go back to, I'm gonna do, yeah, I'm gonna do the same thing again. Okay, so uh, let's go back to that a application that we've been discussing, right? I have 3D, I'm interested in this 2D plane here, and I have two cameras. One camera is over here, right? And that image gets me uh, that camera, excuse me, give me that image. And then I have a second camera, which is tilted, right? Uh, like this. And gives me a different image. Right? So this is one and this is two. And let's say that I'm looking at a square, right? I have a square here. So that image one is going to look something like this, right? Just the actual square, right? So this is my image one, screen. Right? I'm just gonna see that a square that I have here on that plane. And in image two, in image two, I'm gonna have that square with an a shear applied to it, right? 
And it's going to look maybe something like this. And look something like this uh, and like that, right? That's where I'm going to look at because I'm looking at it from this point of view, right? Okay. And then what do we know? We know that these two lines are parallel and these two lines are also parallel in the real world, right? And therefore, if I connect them like this, they're going to cross at some point. And here as well, they're going to cross at some point, right? Yes? And these two points are going to define a line. Whoops. OK, more or less. And what's this line called from last lecture? What is it? What's it called? The line at infinity, right? And that's the line where parallel lines actually cross, right? So we can compute that line at infinity here. This is almost a trivial task for us to do, right? Just to, uh, draw these two lines, these two lines, find the, convert the vanishing points. These two points to find the line at infinity, right? And now I can use the equations of projective projection to solve for that transformation, right? So let's do that. So in canonical coordinates, a line at infinity, we can write it as 0, 0, 1, OK? And this is in canonical coordinates, OK? And then in homogeneous coordinates, uh, a line is given by L1, L2, L3 transpose, right? The three entries that define a line in 3D, uh, excuse me, in 2D. Uh, projective space. And let me call this L. Okay. Now, if this is, if this L, right, for this L to be the image of L infinity, right, for this L to be the image, the line L that I draw there in the image, that is the picture of the line at infinity, right? For this to be the case, what does L3 have to be? Zero, right? Very good. So L3 has to be zero. If L3 is zero, then I know that L is a picture of the line at infinity, right? OK. Good. So let's write this down. I have my H transformation, which is equal to some HA, right? Uh, and uh, what do we have for the projective space? If I have the affine transformation here, I have the identity matrix, right, here. And then I have zeros. And then down here, I'm going to have L1, L2, L3. OK. Now, it's easy to verify. You can do that at home, um, that H inverse transpose times L, that we've defined before, this is actually 0, 0, 1, right? Which is our coordinates, the canonical coordinates for our L infinity that uh, we have to find. So with that fact, we can find the values, right? L1, L2, L3, which are given for this and this. We can find the, the unknowns and solve for that rectification. And what's cool about this 
is that I don't need any point correspondence. Remember point correspondences and solving with least squares? Forget about it. <laughs> you just find these lines, right? Uh, the line at infinity, and you rectify it such that it is the coordinates that you want, right? And you recover the H that you're interested in, right? That's it, you're done. So, homework for you, or optional homework, I'd say. Uh, it's not due, but do when you do that project that I mentioned, right? Go home, take a magazine or some picture, and take a picture of that picture from an angle, right? Do it for a picture that has a line at infinity that you can manually mark on your image, right? And then define that in homogeneous coordinates, L1, L2, L3, and then you just apply this equation, you solve for H, right? And you apply H now to every point of the image that you have, and will rectify that image to a 2D, uh, 2D Euclidean, uh, or up to an Euclidean transformation, right? 2D plane image. OK. Great. Um, Now, when you do that, you have to be very careful because you see how, what I did here? Uh, the line that I draw is actually in the picture, right? It's actually in the image. Typically, the line at infinity is not going to be in the image, right? Uh, say that you're a self-driving car, right? And this is used in self-driving cars. And you use the lines of the road, the lines of the... Uh, uh, buildings around you to find the vanishing points, right? And those will allow you to find the line at infinity. But those lines can go forever until they vanish into a point, right? And your camera is just only limited. So uh, it turns out that most often than not, your uh, line at infinity is going to be outside the image and it's going to look something like this. So imagine that your object is observed like that. Right? So this is your 2D object, or 2D planar object. And then you have your parallel lines, right? Um, I didn't draw this very well. Let me redo it. Because otherwise, this is not going to work. Um, so OK, I'll do it this way. That's going to be easiest. OK. So these are the vanishing points, right? And this uh, inside here is my two-dimensional object. OK, that looks better. Right? And now my line at infinity is this one here, right? which I can compute, but it's just outside the image. <laughs> it's a small detail. Um, so how do you go about solving for this? So here's the algorithm that we're going to apply. Um, I'm going to define, let's see, let me do this. I'm going to define, okay, these are two lines here in the image, and that's a line at infinity, okay, here. And these are the points. And now I'm going to call these, let's see, I'm going to find three points here. Let's call them A, B, and C for the first line and three points for the second line. So let's this line be L and this L prime, for example, right? And this is gonna be A prime, B prime, it's the same as B, and C prime, okay? So these are the coordinates that define my L and the other ones, the coordinates that define L prime, right? Okay, so with this, we work as follows.
one compute the distance between A and B in say norm two, call this D1. The distance between B and C, call it D2. And the distance between A prime, B prime, call it D1 prime. And the distance between B prime, C prime, and call it all in norm two, D2 prime, okay? Fair enough? Okay. Two, uh, the line L is given by the points in homogeneous coordinates, of course. Uh, the line L is given by in homogeneous coordinates. Let's see, it's going to be given by the following points. 0, 1, transpose, D1, 1, transpose, and D1 plus D2, 1, transpose, right? So I start at any point, say 0, 1, right? And then I go D1, which is the distance between the first two points, right? And then I go to the distance between the first and the third point, right? Just D1 plus D2. Uh, and the same applies to uh, L prime. L prime is given by uh, 0, 1, and D1 prime 1, and D2 prime, D2 prime plus D, uh, excuse me, D1 prime plus D2 prime 1. Okay. So 3 find, right, solve for H, the matrix H two by two that maps L to L prime. Uh, and of course, L it's given by my uh, L1, L2, L3, right? In homogeneous coordinates. And then for the image point with coordinates One zero is the vanishing point of each line. Okay, so it's just to find the vanishing point and therefore the line at infinity. And now we still need to find the homography. So now let's define the homography. So computing And that's the easy part once we are here because we've done this before. So remember we want to find this H here, right? This homography. And for that we need some set of uh, point correspondences if we don't want to use the, if we cannot use the lines. Um, and to do that, we're going to use RANSAC. Remember RANSAC? Remember RANSAC from 5460? No? Okay, let's review it very quickly, okay? Um, the problem, remember, that I'm going to have 
is that if I have point correspondences between this image and some other image, maybe I have used SIFT, uh, maybe I have used SURF, or maybe I have just used, I don't know, some corner detection, right? Corner detection or what have you, right? And I still need to find the correlation between the window of each corner with the window of each other corner at the other image, right? Or I use some other types of union. Uh, or even if I use SIFT, SIFT's going to give me some potential pair ma matchings, right? But SIFT is not perfect like any other algorithm. It's going to have errors, right? And this, these errors, so-called outliers, that we're really concerned about. And why are we concerned about it? Because if we use list of squares to solve for this homography, list of squares is f of x equals x squared. And for these outliers, that the square is just going to kill us, right? Because if that outlier gives us a really huge number, right, and we square this, this is going to take most of the relevance of the least square solution, correct? So we want to eliminate that. And in 5460, we saw an algorithm called RANSAC that actually solves for this problem. So let's revisit this very quickly. Uh, so RANSAC is used. to identify the inliers right? and eliminate outliers. So what we want to do is I have a number of points, let's say like this, that are beautifully defining my list of square solution here, right? Beautifully aligned. but I have a number of outliers here, right? They're deviating me from this solution, right? And I need to learn how to uh, not use them. And what we're going to do is, or RANSAC rather, is going to do first is going to select a number, or maybe we could say a small number, right, of S points. Uh, in uh, or point correspondences, right? In both images, and then and use least squares to find a fit, right? A solution. Okay. So we select random points. Maybe we select these points here, and we find the solution here, right? That's our least square solution. It should be terrible, but B. Um, determine the number of points that are within a margin gen uh, T from the model. So let's see an example here. So let's assume that, which is obviously our underlying assumption, that the number of inliers is larger than the number of outliers. Okay. So these are my outliers here. Maybe one more here. Okay. Now let's say that during my first step A, I randomly select, I don't know, maybe these points here, right? And that one and that outlier, right? And it, with this selection, my list of squares result is going to look something like this, right? This is my list of square result for now, right? At iteration one. And then with this, I'm going to have a a distance, right, or a band around that model, right? That computes, that has distance t, right? That computes the points from all my set that are within that line and the ones that are outside of it, right? So maybe I'm going to compute that all of those except maybe this inlier and this outlier, right? So this is maybe going to be in and this is going to be out, right? But I've already eliminated most of the outliers, right? And now 
Once I have done this, I repeat the process, right? And when I repeat the process, I'm going to compute a solution, least square solution, that is even closer to the real one, right? To real solution. And I'm going to eliminate more, more outliers. I'm going to take more inliers, right? And I keep repeating that until I converge. By convergence, I mean that the difference of my least square solution between one iteration and the next is almost zero, right? Smaller than some threshold. And I'm done. So I keep repeating that. Now, there are details, obviously, that I've, uh, I describe in more detail in the 5460 class. If you want to review this, go to the video lectures on YouTube, right? And watch that one lecture. OK. Any questions about this? So now this algorithm can be readily used, right, to improve uh, the estimate of H, because we're not going to include uh, outliers when we identify this. And, um, and eliminate the point correspondences given by one of the algorithms that we have already seen that do not fit our model, right? They're actually uh, not to be used in subsequent uh, iterations for additional algorithms that we're going to define later on in the course. Okay, so um, this is one way to do it. Uh, the other solution is to compute vanishing lines. So let's do that next. Uh, how are we doing here? I well, still have a few minutes, right? Yeah, good. Okay. So now let's see how we can compute vanishing lines. Okay, so to do that, let, uh, say, L0, L1, and L2 be a set of equally spaced lines on a scene, uh, um, a planar scene, let me say that. So more formally, I guess, I'm gonna say that Li, right, the ith line is equal to A, B, I. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. And note that I could also write this as um, a b zero, right? What's a b zero? Anyone? It's a point on the line at infinity plus zero, zero, 001 times my value i, right? Yeah? And what's zero, zero, 001 in canonical coordinates? That is actually the line at infinity, right? Now recall, right, we have said this before, that 
a projective projection is nothing else than x prime times x equals x, or I don't know if we said x, h, x prime. Same thing, right? And li is h inverse transpose times li prime, right? And what's this li prime? Well, this li prime, we can define it as this line here, right? Let's call it L0 and this line L infinity, right? So I can write this, if you want to, as L0 plus I L infinity, right, as well. And remember also that we know that two, um, two lines, Li and Lj, define a vanishing point at the cross product. Right? Remember that? For i different than j, of course. So maybe let me write this. And hence, I can write that the line at infinity is equal to, say, L0 times L2 transpose L1 cross product L2 times L1 plus two times L0 cross product L1 transpose L2 cross product L1 times L2. So it's just another way of defining the line at infinity with known lines that I can obtain from an image, right? And from a set of lines L0, L1, and L2. See that? From these points that we have to find here. So where is that drawing that it did? I erased it, didn't I? Okay, it was here somewhere. <laughs> You have it in your notes, right? <laughs> okay, one more thing and I'll let you go, okay? Just one more, because we really need that one to fi finish the main definitions of all the terminology, well, not all, but most of the terminology of the projective space. Uh, circular points. Now, this is very important. I'm gonna note this because, I mean, we use everything that we define, obviously. We're gonna use everything that we define at some point. Um, the reason we define them is because they are used in the computer vision algorithms, but circular points are especially relevant. So I want to make a note to that. Um, the line at infinity is also given by two very special points called circular points, okay? So the line at infinity are, is also given by circular points. What are circular points? Let's go back to again 5460 when we define uh, the equation of a circle, right? And remember that I could define a circle like this where x, y, w is the vector that defines a circle in homogeneous coordinates, right? Yep, okay, 
Remember that? So R is a radius. Uh, what else? AB1 uh, would be the center of the circle and so on, right? Remember that? Okay. We can easily verify, right? Uh, one can easily verify that one plus minus i is zero, right? Where i here, with this i, is the square root of negative one. Um, our solutions to my equation, right? Right to this equation uh, that I have over here, right? Yeah, because if I substitute uh, this by the correct values, right, I get zeros, right? I get zeros on both sides. These points here are called the circular points. And we'll see next time that they're uniquely defined. And hence, by defining these unique points, we can define the line at infinity too. Okay? And they are invariant to transformations to similarity transformations, which makes them very useful to define the line at infinity. Okay? Now we're almost done with the projective space. We just need to see that and how to use this, and then extend this very quickly to P3, which is the projective space in three dimensions, which is the one that we really want to uh, work on. And in P3, everything that we've seen stays the same, only that the line at infinity becomes the plane at infinity and things like that, right? But everything is just equivalent, right? All right, I'll see you next time. <laughs>